I want to thank Gary Lynn Floyd for the fabulous music today and Gloria and I for reading. We are on week seven of our 12-week series on Chopwood Carry Water. It's a book by Rick Fields. And don't worry if you've missed them. Each week is independent. And the good news is that all of the previous weeks are out on our website at cslsoutheastla.org. So today we're talking about something we often forget to do in our lives. And I think some people might even say is frivolous or a waste of time. And that's play. I'm happy you've joined us today on this journey to enlightenment because we're looking today at how we can chop wood and carry water while playing. Today we're discussing how play is important in your spirituality and how cooperating and competition are both essential for our growth and how you might play the game of life with more laughter and joy. Imagine the ease of life if we each remembered to take time to play and to really enjoy our lives like little kids do and truly embrace these words of Abraham Maslow. Almost all creativity involves purposeful play. But let's begin with your question of the week. What is the one choice that you can make today to find more time to play, to practice laughing more often, and to play the inner game with concentration? One more time. What is the one choice you can make today to find more time to play, to practice laughing more often, and to play the inner game with concentration. So last week I asked you if you had ever truly thought about your relationship with money. And so this week I'd like to ask you a similar question. Have you ever thought about your relationship with playing? Do you see playing as a frivolous waste of time, as a time eater? Or do you recognize the many benefits that play has to offer us all as adults? There's truly a lot to be said for that old saying, all work and no play make Jack a dull boy, or Jill a dull girl for that matter. Many of us, myself included, sometimes focus so much on our work and our family commitments that we fail to take time for fun. Somewhere along the way, we stopped playing. And of course, we might take some time that's leisure time in front of the TV or play a computer game. But what about truly playing? Doing something that's childlike or what we might call goofing off. There's a poem of Sasaka Roshi, who's a Zen master in Los Angeles, and it goes this way. As a butterfly lost in flowers, as a child fondling mother's breast, as a bird settles on the tree, for 66 years of this world, I have played with God. Well, for me, it's more than 66, or perhaps less than 66 if you Eliminate all the years that I didn't take time to play or value it that much. I decided to research the benefits of play and found a lot of information on the benefits of playing for children. But what about us adults? Is it not just as important as adults that we continue to build our imagination and creativity? I did locate a site that documented the many benefits of adults taking time to play. And since play is my 2022 word for the year, I was happy to hear that the Wellbeing and Happiness Help Guide says this. Playing with your romantic partner, friends, coworkers, pets, and children is a sure and fun way to fuel your imagination, creativity, problem-solving abilities, and emotional well-being. 
Adult play is a time to forget about work and commitments and to be social in an unstructured, creative way. That same guide tells us that our play need not have any point to it beyond having fun and enjoying ourselves. And when we play with that joyful abandon of a child, there are actually many health benefits, especially when we play with another person or with a pet and away from those sensory overload of electronic gadgets. So let me name a few of those benefits. Play helps relieve stress because play triggers the release of endorphins and can even temporarily relieve pain. Play helps improve brain functions. Puzzles, chess, and fun activities that challenge the brain help prevent memory problems and improve brain function. Play helps stimulate the mind and boost creativity. It's not just children who learn best when they're playing. The principle applies to adults as well. We learn tasks better when they're fun and in a relaxed and playful mood. Play stimulates your imagination and helps you adapt and solve problems. And play helps improve relationships and your connection to others. Sharing laughter and fun can foster empathy, compassion, trust, and intimacy with others. The really good news to me was play doesn't have to include a specific activity. It can also be a state of mind, a play from nature, which can loosen up stressful situations, can break the ice with strangers, can help you make new friends or form new business relationships. And believe it or not, Play helps keep you feeling young and energetic. I know when I play with little kids that part of me feels really young again. And it takes a lot of energy to keep up with those little ones, or with teenagers for that matter. Have you ever noticed how much energy it takes to roll around on the floor with a baby? And in addition to boosting your energy and your vitality, Play improves your resistance to disease, helping you function at your best. And while we're on the subject of benefits of play, it's not just beneficial in your own life, it's also good for relationships and for work situations. Did you know that play is one of the most effective tools for keeping relationships fresh and exciting? Playing together brings joy and vitality and resilience into the relationship and can also heal resentments and disagreements and hurts. Through regular play, we learn to trust one another and feel safe. And as far as play at work goes, success at work doesn't depend on the amount of time you work. It depends upon the quality of your work and the quality of your work is highly dependent on your well-being. Many a dot-com company has recognized the link between productivity and a fun work environment. Some encourage play and creativity by offering art or yoga classes, by throwing regular parties, by providing games such as foosball or ping pong, or encouraging recess-like breaks during the workday for employees so that they can play and let off some steam. In the early 90s, I worked for a company that had a full gym and they brought in teachers during the day for classes like jazzercise. These companies discovered that play at work results in more productivity, higher job satisfaction, greater workplace morale, and a decrease in staff turnover and in employees skipping work. So how do we learn to play more and to develop our playful side? George Bernard Shaw once said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. 
Now, I have no intention of growing old because I don't play. And it's never too late to develop your playful and humorous side. If you want to stay young, try to clear your schedule for an afternoon or evening every week. And turn off your phone, turn off your TV and your computers and all those other devices, and give yourself permission to do whatever you feel like doing during that time. Be spontaneous. Set aside your inhibitions and try something fun, maybe even something that you used to do as a kid. Enjoy that change of pace. Today is my son's birthday. If he were still on the planet, he'd be turning 47. And one thing I'm certain of, he would still be playing. I'm not surprised at the coincidence that today's topic is play because he knew how to play and to have fun in life. He was a walking example of remembering to play. I love watching him sit on the floor with his son and play with toys. He also taught his son Hunter to play chess and more intellectual games. But the vision of he and my son-in-law Mike playing with Hunter on the living room floor and driving cars all around is one of my most happy memories. It's one I truly savor. And wow, could he make me belly laugh better than anybody I know. That is when he wasn't giving me more gray hairs with more of his dangerous playful adventures. And speaking of laughter, Sasaki Roshi was once asked why he came to America. And his response was, I have come to teach people to laugh. And true to his word, he advised his students to start the day by standing straight up and laughing out loud from deep in the belly. This practice, he said, was equal to many hours of Sazen, which is a sitting meditative practice meant to give insight into the true nature of your being. So in the spirit of play, and spiritual practice, even if you feel silly, I'm going to invite you to laugh with me right now. Just try it. <laughs> I bet you feel better. I know I do. The power of laughter is really interesting, isn't it? Other master teachers have given students similar advice. For example, Rajni said, laughter is tremendously healthy. Playfulness is as sacred as any prayer, or maybe more sacred than any prayer, because playfulness, laughter, singing, dancing will relax you. And the truth is only possible in a relaxed state of being. Long ago, I recognized for myself that truth shows up when I am rested and during those quiet times like meditation. If, like Rajneesh, nice, we truly believe that truth comes through when we are in a relaxed state of being, then let's learn to be playful and laugh more often. And as you heard in the reading, Long Shen Pa, a Tibetan yogi, said, Since everything is but an apparition, perfect in being what it is, having nothing to do with good or bad, acceptance or rejection, one may well burst out in laughter. The world is sometimes a laughable place, is it not? And there's so many places that we could use more laughter. There's a great story about Mary Rose Wood. And a delivery driver knocked on her door when he heard her laughing in the rain. The doors to the garden were open right next to her actual little apartment. And the sound of laughter had come from there. She was just entering the building waving a cheerful goodbye to someone from under her bright orange umbrella. 
Ah, I made it just in time, it seems, she said, and walked in, leaning on her cane. I had her lunch in my trolley and waited for her to open the door. There you go, she said, and opened the door. You may put the food on the kitchen table. I'll warm it up in the microwave later. I took her meal and carried it indoors. The route to her small kitchen took me through her living room. As before, I couldn't help glancing at the pictures on her living room walls. Other people living in the old folks' home had traditional landscape paintings or religious pictures on their walls, but not Mrs. Rosewood. Her walls were filled with pictures of comedians, the Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, Jim Carrey, Leslie Nielsen, Steve Martin, Goldie Hawn. You're looking at my pictures, I see, she said, cheerful voice coming from behind him. Well, yes. Can I ask you why you have them there? Isn't it obvious? I like to laugh. Look here, she said, and she opened up a cupboard next to her television. He saw films, dozens of them, all comedies. No Casablanca, no Gone with the Wind, only comedies. Now that's a bit unexpected, he said. It's a hobby of yours? Comedies, I mean? Not a hobby, but a way of life, young man, she said. I did not know what to say. She turned to push the window open and laughed. And again, I heard her laughter in the rain. I had very serious parents, she said, very religious. I was taught ever since I was a child in life that life was dire business and useless laughter took you nowhere. Nowhere good, that is. Unfortunate for them, I did not believe, and she laughed. When I was a teenager, I became acquainted with our neighbors. She used to be a nun. Used to, said the guy. That sounds interesting. Yes, a bit like Maria in The Sound of Music, Mrs. Roadwood smiled. I asked why she was no longer a nun, and she said it was too gloomy. I talked with her, and she knew what my parents thought about laughter and being happy. And one day, she started talking to me about laughter. Mary, tell me how you feel when you laugh. I told her I felt happy. And how do you feel when you are totally loved? Totally. I wondered how she could know that I was so much in love, up to my ears in love with someone, but I answered that I felt happy. And have you heard someone say God is total love? Well, that was easy. I'd heard that all my life, many, many times. Well, tell me then, she said, if someone is total love, totally made of love, how would he feel? Happy, of course. What do happy people do? They laugh. So if God is total love, you might expect God laughs a lot. Why then would laughter be bad, she asked. Now, here is a question I had not thought about before. And tell me, Mary, why would it not work the other way around, too? Mrs. Rosewood turned into her kitchen and left me standing there. I waited for a short while, and then I just had to ask, what did she mean by that? And again, I heard her laughter. In the rain, a blackbird was singing beautifully. I thought you'd never ask, she said. So I'll tell you what she said. Dwelling in negative thinking and complaining about things are just ways to tell you don't trust life can be good. In other words, you're stating your distrust to your creator. So think about it in such a way that you may search for happiness and laughter purposefully. It gets you closer to God, who is laughter, joy, and happiness. Now, she used the word God, but if you're happier with some other term, no problem. She meant the creating force of the universe. 
Mrs. Rosewood said, have to be careful with other people and their faith. Oh, it's quite all right, I said. God is good. Yes, indeed, she smiled. But that's when I started to find laughter on purpose. My parents did not approve and told me so. I was so stubborn enough to continue. I bought funny books. I went to see funny movies. I wrote down the best jokes I found. And this week, oh, this is so much fun. I found out there's such a thing as laughter yoga. I'm going to try it next week. Yoga at your age, I started. Oh, it's just laughter, laughter on purpose. No one needs to bend themselves into a knot, she said, and laughed. And time has taught me I took the right road. I met my husband at a movie theater when I went to see Goldie Hawn movie, not to mention other friends I met through laughter. She bent towards me. You see, I'm following the advice of that neighbor. I inherited that cross-stitch picture from her. I looked at the picture above the TV. It said, the purpose of life is joy. She gave it to me shortly before it was her time to go to her maker and said, look at this and remember it. Always try to be the sound of laughter in the rain. Life is so hard for so many people. It is like an eternal continuing rainy day. They're not happy. So you be happy. Show them the way. Be the laughter in the rain for them. Be as happy as you can. Only then can you spread happiness to others. Even though 20 years have passed since that rainy day, I always remember Mrs. Mary Rosewood. We became good friends and she often invited me to watch funny movies with her. I met many of her friends and we spent many a laughter-filled evening together. There was a lot of laughter in the rain and in the sunshine. When Mrs. Rosewood died, she donated all her money to a local theater with the instruction that the money be used to produce one comedy play per year. And guess what the first play was? Laughter in the Rain. To me, she gave all her funny pictures of her funny people. I still have them hanging on my study walls. All faded with time, of course, but just as valuable as ever. Their smiles haven't faded at all. And when I look at the cross-stitch message, the purpose of life is joy, I always remember the time I heard her laughter in the rain. And to honor her life's work of bringing joy to the people around her, I try to be the sound of laughter in the rain to others as well. I love that story because it reminds me of the power of laughter, of the power of positive thinking, and of the total love that exists when people know how to play and laugh. In Science of Mind magazine, Ernest Holmes wrote this. This is the attitude we should assume, that life holds nothing against us. It desires only our good. It wants us to be well, happy, and successful. But it wants us to play the game of life the way it is supposed to be played, in unity and cooperation with others. I, for one, am happy that Mary Rosewood did not listen to her parents. And of course, you know, I would love to have that cross stitch that says, the purpose of life is joy. Definitely my kind of picture. Tim Galway, who wrote The Inner Game of Tennis, said that every game we play is comprised of two parts, an outer game and an inner game. That is true of the game of life as well, in which the outer game, competition, spurs us on to do our best. But it's the inner game which turns out to be the most difficult one. So how do we play the inner game and make life a spiritual practice? Here's a few tips. Make laughter your catalyst. 
If you have trouble remembering to play, notice when you hear someone laugh and make that the catalyst for you to take some time to play, either then or within a short period of time. Use playgrounds as reminders. The next time you see a playground or a swing set, remember that all of life is a playground. It's up to you to choose to play. And make play cooperative. When you participate in a game, vow to make the play more cooperative and less competitive. And surround yourself with playful people. Let others be your teachers and give in to your playful side. Remember, the purpose of life is joy. So enjoy life. I want to end with one of my favorite quotes by Florence Shovel Sheen, who in The Game of Life and How to Play It, wrote this. In the 23rd Psalm, we read, He restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind, or soul, must be restored with the right ideas. And the mystical marriage is the marriage of the soul and the spirit, or the subconscious and the superconscious mind. How better to restore our soul than to remind ourselves in the game of life that both the outer and inner games are important. And the inner game requires us to pause and play with God, as Sasaki Roshi suggested, so that we might fully and creatively enter into that mystical marriage of the soul and the spirit. summary. Decide what it is you want your relationship with play to be. And remember, find time to play. Play relieves stress. It enhances relationship. It increases productivity. It boosts creativity. And practice laughing more often. Laugh in the rain. Laugh at yourself or by yourself. The purpose of life is joy. Play the inner game with concentration. Use laughter in playgrounds to remind you to play and enter into that mystical marriage of the soul and the spirit. So here's your affirmation for the week. How is it that I so easily and willingly make the choice today to find more time to play, to practice laughing more often, and to play the inner game with concentration. So your challenge for the week is to play more, to surround yourself with playful people, to notice stress and relieve it with laughter and make laughter and play a spiritual practice. Remember those words of Abraham Maslow, almost all creativity involves purposeful play. Let's pray. We take a deep nourishing breath and we just recognize that God that is total love, that God that knows that laughter and happiness and joy are truly the purpose of life. Hmm. And being expressions of the divine, all of that knowledge, all of that wisdom about play is right within each of us. And what I know this week is that each of us is remembering to play more, to pause, to laugh more, to be the laughter in the rain for someone who's going through a hard time, to just recognize all of the benefits of laughter, of joy, 
Hmm. I am so grateful to have this opportunity to talk about playing, to know that you have joined us in this adventure through playing, and that laughter is filling your heart and allowing you to relieve stress and to feel more creative. Hmm, and it's from all that gratitude that I release this into the law, into that divine that always says yes. Knowing that it's already done, knowing that my words have been heard and answered. And so I can just say amen and we can affirm it together. And so it is. I am so grateful for all of you that continue to provide us with your tithes through money, through your talents and treasures. And we are continuing to look for a place to have services. You will be the first to know. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to have the finances to be able to do that. So thanks again for all your contributions. Enjoy our offertory song. <laughs> 